Good afternoon, everyone. I believe we're live. Uh, welcome to Bonahaven for our Fish Warehouse 9 tasting. Um, good to see you all in virtual sense, not in reality, obviously. Um, right. What we're going to do is I'm going to introduce what's the who, who we've got with us today and then a rough outline for, for the next hour or so. So there's me, I'm Billy, I'm stuck in the, the, the wee tasting room at the visitor centre out the way. Um, on my screen, on the top right, we've got uh, our guide, Rodney. Hi, Rodney. Hi there. Uh, bottom like left, we've got the, the mighty Colin. Bonjour. And a face that many of you will be oh too familiar with, Mr. David Brody. Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, to to preempt Dave and to save him a bit of hassle because he hasn't got a window, the weather on Idle is nice today. That's the shortest weather report you're going to get. Right. I do hello. Basically. The plan for this afternoon for, a, for an hour or two is, is that you're going to be stuck with the four of us having a few drams, talking nonsense. Um, if you've got your tasting kits with the wee tasting mats in them, please feel free to join us. Uh, if you haven't got your tasting kits yet, um, don't worry about it. Grab a dram and just sit back and, and join in anyway. It's all part of the game. Um, happy to take questions. Just bounce them into the chat and we'll get to as many of them as we can as we go through the tasting. Um, and that's pretty much the plan. If anyone's got any burning concerns or anything, just bounce us an email and we'll get to it in about three weeks. As far as we know, there are no fire alarms <laughs> time for this afternoon, but locate your nearest emergency exit so you know where you're going just in case. That's the health and safety thing covered, so we're good to go. Right, so this is uh, the second year in a row that we've had a virtual fish, so it's not quite the same as, as normal. Um, normally, we'd have about 100 to 150 people going through the warehouse with one of, one of these guys on fish day. Um, but we are where we are, and we'll, we'll do the best we can. So, Warehouse 9. If anybody's been to Warehouse 9, pop a wee message in the comment section, and we'll reminisce. Um, Dave, you've done a lot of Warehouse 9 tastings in the past. Is it different at fish than it is normally? It can be a little bit uh, different on a, a fish day, um, really simply because of the numbers that are involved. Because most, most of the time, most of the rest of the year in a normal year, um, we'll have a warehouse nine in the morning and it will be scheduled for a certain period of time and it will no doubt run over that time um, occasionally, sometimes more often than, than occasionally. Um, but you can't have that happen on face day. Um, the last time we had everybody here, uh, the duties for Warehouse 9 didn't fall to me on that particular day. It was Colin's uh, job to, to look after there. But I think the, the numbers tend to be 25 thereabouts. Occasionally it creeps up towards the 30, and we have to do our best to maybe have five or six tastings in the course of a day. Now, that's not not ideal, but people take it in the right spirit of the event. They come in, they know that there's going to be a lot of people there, and we certainly try our very, very best to make it the full experience. In other words, some great drams, um, variety of drams, a variety of casks, talk a bit about the place, talk about the drams themselves, but more than anything else, pass the tasting over to the people because it's it's a tasting that has evolved over the sort of five to six years that we've done it and um, we never ever had a script all we've had is good drams and the coming and going between the people involved in it and and it's just right, david can i just interrupt you for a second this is a very unusual request and a very unusual comment but we can hardly hear you can you speak up or lean <laughs> in a wee bit <laughs> Normally we're telling David to be quiet, but I, I, I wish now that I'm, now that I'm sitting a little bit closer to my iPad, I wish I'd gone to Colin's dentist and get these things fixed. But there you go, you've just seen me in all my ugly beauty. Yeah, no, it's, as I say, I'll, I'll, I'll speed it up a little bit. Face day, warehouse nine, lots of people have to turn the, the tastings over fairly quickly. You've just got one lot out the door, the next lot are due in, and it's a really full-on day. Uh, the rest of the year, it's a little bit more relaxing than that. Um, but we are time-bound, so I'll shut up for just now. 
<laughs> right. For those of you that have been to Warehouse Nine before, basically what we do is we sample a few drams straight from the cask, and that's what we're going to have a, a wee taste of this afternoon. This isn't my normal core range that you'd, you'd be familiar with if you were uh, used to that um, as your main drams. These are something a little bit special that we, we have in the, in the warehouse. Um, warehouse is probably one of our, our biggest tours, uh, tasting events. We do a lot of warehouses throughout the year and we, we drink a lot of drams, so it's, it's a good complaint. The first dram that we're going to taste uh, this afternoon is the one that's the 2007 bourbon barrel in your little tasting kits. Um, if you haven't got the tasting kit, pour a dram. The, the bourbon barrels that we have aren't necessarily the, the biggest part of the, the Bunnahaven maturation style, but this is an absolutely stunning little cask. Colin, do you want to run us through this a wee bit for us? Absolutely, Billy. Thank you. Um, here you go, guys. This is the bottle itself. It's what we're looking at. So it's a 13-year-old bourbon cask, and it's coming in at 55.7% ABV. Um, so it's a, a good length of time. 13 years is stunning in, in, in our cast, but with our new make spirit works fantastically in, in the, the, the uh, hogshead that we put it in. Um, the cask itself, um, we got that from Heaven Hill, I believe. It's one of the, one of the few suppliers that we have for the, for the bourbon casks, but absolutely fantastic drown. We've had some younger bourbons in the past, but this is just absolutely wonderful. On the nose, a lot of people get get that vanilla maybe some people get tropical fruit on the nose like the pineapples things like that um not normally like our sherries we normally get a bit more dried fruit but we certainly get a lot of vanilla maybe some citrus in there some some lemons lemon lime but what a lovely nose what a lovely nose let's have a, a wee taste Oh, it's lovely, lovely. On the glass, the legs, wonderful. Very, very oily, I find. Um, I know Rodney's not a fan of me talking about legs on, on the glasses, but beautiful. Very, quite oily, in my opinion. Um, again, this is my opinion. It's not um, it's not a written rule that this is what it's going to taste like or what you're going to get. But again, that, that, that fruit and that citrus, vanilla comes across still on the palate, which is, I think, quite quite synonymous with, with Bunahav. And what you get on the nose, quite often it is translated across to the palate as well but i think it's just a fantastic dram 55.7 percent so it's, it's a it's a decent strength not overly aggressive so you wouldn't think it's maybe so high very pale no straw color but a very typical bunahaven bourbon cask single cast 13 years full of maturation in that cask yeah i think it's lovely what do you think rodders Ah, sure. I'm not even sure. It's such a, a typical one. The, the, Dave, when Dave first tasted this one, he was saying he was actually teaching me how to uh, pick out bourbon in in when you get a little bit of bourbon, a little bit of sherry. The sharpness of this. But actually, I know strangely, I usually hate the tasting notes, but I know exactly what you're talking about with the the pineapple. I never tasted the pineapple in it until you just said it there. And that's lovely. Would I lie to you? Well, you're often mistaken, but you know. Well, there you go. We go we'll go with that then. What do you think, Dave? Any good? I know you like this one, Dave. I love, I love this cask. Go on. That's <laughs> enough from David. <laughs> <laughs> um, just got a couple of folks saying hello there. We've had um, Stuart from Isle of Taxi saying he can't believe the warehouse nine isn't scripted. Cheers, Stuart. <laughs> um, <laughs> Dwayne Large. Called in. Hi, Dwayne. How you doing? Hope you're feeling better, mate. And good to see you back up on your feet. We'll look forward to having you back over in Isla again soon. Uh, Glynis, another regular visitor up here um, on Isla when we can. Good to good to see you there. Um, I think Dave's having some internet connections. Um, here he is. Yep, he's there back. <laughs> I'm back again. Apologies. I had to nip out there a minute. I don't know what happened. I really don't know what happened. I was... <laughs> But anyway, yeah, this little bourbon barrel. We've had we've had a few bourbon casks over the, the time that we've been doing these tastings. And they've never disappointed. Um it seems to be like, like our, our main source for our bourbon barrels is Kelvin Cooperage. And they they never seem to disappoint us. Um but I just think this one's a cracker. Uh but this is another one of these drams that I occasionally come across where the hardest thing is to stop nosing it 
and drink it because <laughs> the aromas on it are just beautiful, absolutely beautiful, almost floral. Um, it's very different from what would class as the normal Bonahaven style, which is much fruitier, much richer, much more sherry mature based. But for me, I think this is a really good example of how Bonahaven spirit works across the board in different styles of casks. Very, very delicate aromas coming off it, very delicate aftertaste, but just packed full of flavour. The longer I'm drinking this one, the more it feels like I'm getting a sweetness with this one, which we don't normally get so much with, our, with bourbon. I think with the 13 years influence from that cask, I think the sweetness is starting to come out on the, on the finish there. Person, personally think. Yeah. I'd be interested to hear if anyone's tasting coconut. That always, I've never <laughs> tasted the coconut that you're supposed to get on it, but there's gorgeous sweetness, as you're saying, it's beautiful. Well, we've got Gunther saying it's a basket of tropical fruits. It's perfect. But again, it's a, it's a very light, delicate flavour. There's, there's lots of different things going on in that dram. <laughs> Why did I only buy one glass? <laughs> <laughs> it's, I, mean, I know these, these tastings are not great. Um, in the sense of we're not there in person, but one of the things when you're when you're looking through some of the comments here, we've got folk in Japan, we've got folk in Canada, we've got folk in all sorts of states in the US, all across Europe. It's it's a very very elegant way of bringing a lot of people together at one one time, even in a in a sort of slightly surreal kind of way. So, absolutely, absolutely. Right, um, somebody's mentioned there. Um, how do we pick? the casks for Warehouse 9, um, and I suppose that the proper person to answer that is our blender, Julianne. But um, we go through that process with Julianne, looking at what casks are available and what would fit with what we are wanting to try and achieve and what, what Julianne's wanting to try and achieve. But sitting behind Rodney there and behind David, there's a whole range of bottles. Um, Rodney, do you want to have a, a wee word about how we managed to, to do the hand filling? Oh. <laughs> Well, it's, it's kind of laborious. We'll hopefully step up soon and get uh, more machinery. But yeah, it's uh, basically just sucking it out of the, the barrel and putting it into bottles. It's all labels, all handwritten. It's a uh, uh, very hands-on process. And that's that's the thing about all these these whiskies that we get in Warehouse Nine. They're single casks, and when they're gone, they're gone. Uh, we might get sister casks to some of them back again, but they're never exactly the same. And that, for me, is part of the, the beauty of these things that they're unique snapshots of whiskey in a cask at any one time. And you've just got to drink it. The, 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 you've just got to get on with it. You've got to let it go and just get through it. It's, you know, there'll be new special <laughs> stuff coming along the line in a couple of years and just enjoy it. It's very much for drinking. It's not mostly a collectors. No. It we do have these, obviously. A lot of these we have available in the shop. 20 CL bottles, 3 CLs. We have the 70 CLs on some of them, full bottle size. And we have some, on, I believe, on the website as well. Um, limited numbers, but we certainly have them. So it, it's nice that if you do come here and you've sat in the warehouse, you've gained that experience of, of being in there amongst the sherry casks and actually get to taste some of these. It's amazing that people just want to get their hands on a bottle to take away because they're just exclusive. Like you say, they're one, one bottle only. Um, very different. Very, very bottle. Yeah. Yeah. I've just put one or two drops of water into that. And that sweetness that you were alluding to, Colin, just opens right out. It's like honey and all sorts yeah. of rich meadow flowers coming through on it. It's so soft and delicate, absolutely gorgeous. Gorse comes through. That, that'll be where your coconut comes from, Rodney. You're getting that? The gorse. All right. I believe it, I just I'm not, I, I can't get it. It's what you're supposed <laughs> to get. But the, the pineapple is coming across, absolutely. It's a, the tropical fruits that people are talking about. Can, can I just maybe add my kind of final thought on this particular dram from the bourbon barrel? Um, we don't put out a lot of stuff that is bourbon barrel or bourbon barrel matured, but it's the most commonly used cask in the whiskey world. It's almost like a common denominator, and it's a good way of judging how good the quality of your spirit is. And if you can put out a dram from a simple bourbon barrel, and it can delight the way that this particular dram delights, then you're doing well. Absolutely. That's thought, a good for, thought for the day. Bourbon's not going to mask anything. So if you've got bad spirit, then bourbon's not going to. A really intense PX could cover a lot. A really intense peat could cover a lot, but the bourbon's not going to 
cover anything up. That's nice. Okay. I think we're going to draw the line under our, our bourbon experience and so I say that's our, our homage to our, our cousins across the water and we're going to move back over, over this way a wee bit now. Um, when we got this next cask into the warehouse, it was a bit of an enigma and I'm going to ask David to, to talk us through this one in a wee minute and I'm going to ask him to, since he's in, we've, we've actually got the evolution of the Bonahaven shop going on today. Because we've got Colin sitting in the old shop up the wee rickety stairs office at Andrew and Lillian's office. We've got David sitting in what we call the old shop, which is at the bottom of the pier. And Rodney and I are in the new shop, which is in the visitor centre. And I know Colin's pointing in different directions to me. But yeah, we're, at, we're in the new visitor centre down at the, the, the start of the, the distillery grounds themselves. And if you hear any knocking sounds, it's the three guys standing outside the window staring at us and trying to get in the door. Um, so apologies if you hear a, a banging sound in the background. Um, we're going to move on to the, the second dram now, which on your on your tasting kits is called the Rechard. And it's a 2003 Rechard Hogshead that we're going to taste here. And let's say that this was a little bit of an enigma when it came into the warehouse because we, we didn't have a huge amount of information on it. And Dave, I'm going to hand over to you if you can shout down the, the iPad to us all there. You're in the shop yourself. It's okay. You're not disturbing the neighbours. Um, if, if you can take us through the, the this one a wee bit, please. Absolutely. I, I hope um, everybody can hear me now and I hope I'm being heard a little bit clearer than what I'm picking you guys up because it's a little bit no. disappointed. Not really. No, <laughs> no. no. Good. Oh, well. Moving on. This particular dram, 2003 Rechar. As Billy said, where's my camera? That's what it says on the bottle, 2003 Rechar. We got this cask through... Um, Julianne had picked it for us. Now, when the casks generally come into Warehouse 9, we're told in rough terms what they are. It's maybe a Pedro Jimenez or it's maybe a wine cask of some sort. All we get told was a recharge, and we didn't really know anything about it. So what you would normally do in circumstances like that is you would go and physically look at the cask itself and try and find out if there was any clues, any marks, anything to distinguish where the cask has maybe been in the past. And this one really had absolutely nothing. We looked at the cask itself, um, and it's a, it's a hog's head, so a 250 litre cask, but a little bit of an odd shape, a little bit narrow and a little bit kind of pointier at the, the cask ends than what you would normally expect, and no markings on it whatsoever. It was a good age, it was 2003, and when it had been re-gaged, it was sitting at 45.5% ABV. Now that's its cask strength, and that's quite a low cask strength. That's less than what we actually bottle our core range at. So, it really is just a little bit of an enigma of a cask. We know it's been recharred. We know it's been stripped down. We know that the, the staves have had a little bit of a rub and it's been, been recharred again. Um, but other than that, we don't really know an awful lot. Um, I even went to the extent of, of asking um, the Oracle, Lillian, in the office to check her filling records and see if she could give us any more information on it. And as she, she did, she found it. And it was strange because when it was filled, it was actually filled not at our normal casking strength. It was actually filled at just over 58% ABV, which kind of explains why it's come down as far as 45.5%. It doesn't explain why it was filled at that strength. There was maybe a crossover of spirit or who knows. So it's a little bit of a mystery. But you just accept it for what it is. It's something of an unusual cask. Um, let's, let's stick some in a glass. A wee bit ahead of you. A bit ahead of you there, Dave. <laughs> so He's busy uh, talking. 
na escala Decent legs. Stick it on your nose. And when I was trying to come up with um, some details on detailed tasting notes for this, I'm not the best at painting a picture. <laughs> but the only thing I got, I only get one, one, one aroma. And that's butter, butterscotch, tablet, that kind of smell. And I can't get past that. I can't get past it. Take the practice swing. Because the first taste of every dram is not the one that's going to tell you the whole story. That just prepares your mouth to really absorb the flavours of the whiskey when you take your next swig, your next taste. Mm. Now, it changes. It changes. I've moved away from that buttery kind of sense that I was getting on the nose. And it's starting to give up a bit of fruit. It's bright. It's zesty. Somebody even came up with the idea that there's a bit of candy floss in there. Now, I'm not sure if we've started adding candy floss to our whiskies as we mature. I don't think that's happening yet. But certainly, you can see where it's coming from. I don't think the SWA let us add candy floss, Dave. What do you think of this dram, guys? On the nose, I'm getting loads of orange zest, orange peel. On the nose. Um, on the palate, it's almost still getting that oranginess, but almost like a chocolate orange. So the the it's the good. fruit is immediate. The, the, not getting that preamble, the, the butterscotch, but to me it's like uh, apple pie filling more. See, it starts off really grassy and really sweet for me, but then when you taste it, the aftertaste is almost like chilli and, and lime. It's quite zesty, quite spicy. For a, a really quite a, an interesting finish for quite a mellow dram. Hmm. Absolutely smooth, smooth as anything. Typically smooth, typical Bunnahaven smooth, but it's a shame we don't know more about the car so we can try and repeat this because it's so good. No, I like that. It's a bit of fun that it's just like, it's just reach out. You're just getting the qualities from the wood. It's wood shooters, fruitiness, but no, you can't really nail it down very well. Colin. Alistair sent really a good. question there saying, um, can you explain what reach out is, Colin? Um, that's basically... Yeah, that's basically what you do is you, when the when you've emptied your cast, you basically get it re, you get it shaved on the inside, taking a layer of the of the wood off, um, and then you basically stand it on its end and set fire to it. That allows it to to awaken itself up and it allows it to to start absorbing that that um the new make spirit again next time around. But yeah, so that's basically what you're doing. You're just taking a bit of a layer off. I think the the rule of thumb is you can do that up to about seven times with a cask. Um, I think we do it less than that. Um, I think seven times is because obviously you keep shaving the inside out, you're going to make the wood too thin. Um, so it possibly wouldn't hold the weight of the liquid inside. Um, but we like to use ours three, four, maybe five times because we want to get the best out of the cask. We want the flavours, we want that that colour. Um, so not always seven is, is really the best answer. But that should give you a rough idea. It was interesting, though, what you said there, Rodney, about, you know, um, kind of, repeating or duplicating the flavors from one cask to another. For me, that is one of the absolute beauties of the Warehouse Nine casks, is the, they are also very, very different. And every now and again, you just get something that is so left field, so different, hmm. that it's not really going to be part of day-to-day -day, um, maturation 
uh, core range products or anything like that. Um, the one that springs to my mind was about four or five years ago when a cask was rolled into Warehouse 9 and it was actually called a bourbon finish. And everybody was like, what's a bourbon finish? And it was Andrew, it was Andrew Brown that remembered that one of the silent seasons, sort of six or seven years previous to this, um, he was looking for jobs for the boys to do. And one of the things they did was they re-racked some tired casks and it came out of sherry refill and it went into bourbon barrel. So mm. kind of the, the wrong way around to the accepted way of doing it. And, and the whiskey was just a stunner. It was absolutely beautiful. But you're not gonna you're not gonna replicate that, nor nor would you want to. It was a one off. This is a one off. I, there will never be another drama like this one. As you're saying, it's got an odd history, but that's what this is all about. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I love I love that part of it. I love the fact that we get the the the, the oddities, the enigmas. You know, um, I just you know, and Ju Julianne is. is is brilliant. She's a, an absolute wizard for, for picking the casks. I think as well, part of the, 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 the warehouse tasting, be it any warehouse tasting, but it's it's nice to be feel as though you're locked away somewhere that the, the public doesn't really get to go to, and it's a special kind of place to be, and to sit and drink drams straight from the cask is, is a fantastic experience that is, is, is one that you want to replicate. Just on the, on the recha thing, Ella's come back with um, is there much difference between recharring a cask and the, the stave changing that Compass Box do? And essentially, it's just like marrying up different flavours of newer and older wood to get a particular flavour profile. Mm. Dave, I'm looking at you here, you can't tell. <laughs> no, I, I, you're not even moving in my screen, Billy. Uh, <laughs> and, and my sound's really bad. I never picked so yeah, it's, it's basically uh, it's basically a, a way of, of marrying together fresher wood with older wood and different flavour profiles from the, 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 the wood to give a, a different particular um, maturation flavour to the, the liquid that's in the cask. Um, I think it was a, one, of, one of the other Isla distilleries did a, a bottling a year or so back that every second stave had been recharred as well um to give a different flavor profile so it's a very similar process just to, to refresh some of the wood but not to put it into virgin wood that would overwhelm the flavor and, and to, to balance that around and that's where your, your your master blenders and things like that come into their own to balance those different flavor profiles to get something that they would like to have in, in the bottle uh, billy as the as the the boss here you know contacts with the higher ups of higher ups do you have, do you do you know whether it is partly the the master Blender just getting sort of bored, playful, just trying. <laughs> stuff with the, you know, just I think one of the key characteristics for me for any of the, the, the master blenders and stuff that I've ever met is that, that they've got a really particular thread to their, their psyche that says, I wonder what would happen if. Yeah, yeah. And it's about, it's about being able to, to play around with those different styles of cast, those different combinations of liquids and different maturation finishes, just to see what happens. And if it works, well, hey, fantastic. If it doesn't, eh, we'll not do that again. Yeah. And that's that's all part of the fun and games, I suppose. Everybody's got the, the fun parts of their job. And so for me, that would be the fun part of a master blender's job. That's happening in the warehouse all the time, is you'll get some that are, like you're saying, eh, we'll not do that again. But you'll get one in 20 that just lights up like that's my dram. You yeah. know, the consensus generally is that was interesting, but uh, and then you'll get somebody in the group. No, 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 no. I'm having you know, I'm having gallons of that. <laughs> uh, Rennie was asking about the the rechart. Um, basically, we we haven't got any of that available online, Rennie. It's all at the distillery. It was a small cask, but not a lot in it. So we're we're being slightly jealous of everything and keeping that here. There are limited stocks of all the other bottles that we're tasting tonight on on the website, and we've got some here at the distillery. If you make it over to Kayla. Can I just interrupt a second, Billy? Um, we've got a guy here, Ryan Page, has put a message on saying, can we export to Mauritius? If the if the price is right, I'll hand deliver that. I think there's a queue for hand deliver to Mauritius, and I'm first in the queue, because there's really good diving in Mauritius as well, so I've snagged that by the um, Katrina, um, our web guru, is in the background here. So, Katrina, if you can bounce me a message and let me know if we can ship to Mauritius, I'll pass that on 
as soon as that comes through. <laughs> um, right, okay. What we're going to do now is start getting ready to, to taste dram number three. But first of all, keep firing the questions in, guys. Um, happy to help answer any that we can as time goes on. We're doing okay for time. We're only about halfway through and we've just had two drams and a lot of lot of talking. So that's that's good. We're on schedule. And if you're up for it, don't forget we've got the master class tasting happening tonight at eight o'clock where you can ask all those techie questions to our, our distilleries manager, Brendan, our blender, Julianne, and the distillery manager, Andrew. Um, they'll be able to answer a lot more of the, the sort of technical questions and the, the more detailed historic questions for that. Okay, dram number three um, is the one that's in your kit labelled an 11-year-old wine hogshead. Now, I said I wanted to talk about this one uh, for a, a very particular reason, that normally um, I don't really like wine cask finishes. And I, I set this one to myself as, as homework to try and every day is a school day so I wanted to learn a bit more and I wanted to learn a little bit more about my palate and how I can I, I can adapt it a wee bit to, to, to new things and not be so, so closed about what uh, my preconceived ideas. So what we've got in here is an 11 year old wine hogshead, it's bottled at 57.0%. Um, on the nose, it's quite sweet, it doesn't come across as, as too grapey. And it's not musty, so we're not getting a, a, on the nose. I'm not getting a lot of the, the grape influence there. It's quite soft. Bit of cereal. Now again, a bit of the grain coming through rather than the grapes. And there's a wee hint. No, that that way when you get soft wood and you're cutting fresh wood, and you get a, a little bit of that that, that spiciness coming through in the nose. When you taste it. Oh my goodness, first hit is so sweet of that. It's just sugar and grapes and, and fruit all in the front of the palate. And then you start to get more and more sort of vanilla notes coming through. And at the end, it's, it's quite spicy, but it's also got what I would have looked for right at the start, that musty grape note coming on, that dryness of a, a, a dry wine. And doing, doing my best, David, um, we, we, examined, we examined the cask and we, we sort of pried into the background a wee bit. And this is actually a cask that comes from a distillery, um, a distillery, a winery in Spain called Rymat. And Rymat is built in 1914 in the middle of nowhere. It was basically a sandy desert. And at one point, they had the biggest concrete structure in Spain. And it was a huge architrave ceiling um, storage area that they had in the winery for storing all their casks in. And it's an absolutely amazing building and an amazingly good um, winery. Produces lots of different wines, very big into organic stuff. And this cask for me has changed my perception of wine cask finishes for whiskey. It's second hit on it. Not quite as sweet, but you're starting to get more of the tannins coming through. You're starting to get a little bit more of that spiciness. And it's a lovely warm and finish to it. What do you think to that one, guys? Lovely, very really nice. I think the nose and the and the palate are totally different on this one. What you would expect on the palate, you don't get that with the nose at all. I'm getting again. I'm getting citrus, that citrus peel. But on the palate, you're getting exactly what you expected with a, a Bonnerhaven in a wine cask, in, in my opinion. But beautiful, absolutely, beautiful. it works so well, so so well. And as you're saying, a huge difference between the first sip and the second sip. There's a there's a, a very different set of qualities coming out. I struggled with this one for a long time, but there's like a there's a sort of a sharp beginning to it. Uh, what like struggling to say what what the second phase is. And the best I could come up with was something like cream. It's like a there was an odd, uh, yeah. I really struggled to phrase that, and that's the best I can do. It's not bang on, but <laughs> it like a most I, I, sharp quality into a sort of creamy effect. But I think this changes almost with every taste. It, mm. it kind of evolves. It's, it's not a simple drama. It's quite complex. Nice. Absolutely, absolutely. You get so something there's, there's a couple of questions come in there. Suki says, I've got black sediment in the glass from this one. That's probably some of the char that's come off the inside of the cask when we're bottling it. We, we, we pick out most of the big lumps, but sometimes okay. a little bit of that goes through. <laughs> and realistically, we should be charging you extra for that bottle. 
Um, <laughs> for that. Yeah, it's perfectly fine. Don't worry about it. It's just little bits of the char that's fallen into the, the liquid as what they can to get into the, 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 the bottle. And it's not, to me, it's not sweeter than a PX. It's a different kind of sweetness. If you think about vanilla sweetness and citrus sweetness, two very different kinds. And this for me is a different kind of sweetness to a PX, but still very grape sweet, fruit sweet. You David. would never get that that spiciness off a PX cask. No. That, that kind of little bit of fire round about the edge of the tongue, you're not going to get that off a PX. It's only a wine, you know, a, a wine. I, I know PX is a sherry wine, but uh, it's only a wine cask that's going to give you that zing mm. round about the edge of your tongue. And someone's asked, is, is this one a bit smoky, a bit peaty? Totally unpeated. No smoke there at all for us. Yeah. Mind you, it was sitting next to Ammonia PX cask in the Warehouse 9 tasting area, so maybe it's absorbed a little bit from that. Uh, uh, Bobby McCall uh, writes in saying that you guys must be really enjoying work at this point in the Friday afternoon. Uh, yeah, Bobby, we are. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a bad one. Aye. Beautiful jam. So good for a wine cask. Mm. Lovely. A lot of folk coming through with that, that spicy, peppery finish on it that really does seem to build after the second and third sip. Started yeah. off light and sweet and grassy, then went completely the opposite end. It's, it's building and building every every time you take that. Yeah, it just stays with you for ages. It's long, yeah. it's just spiciness. And... I'm getting Spire the finish of the I'm getting a little bit leathery on the finish. Right. That's, yeah. that's because on my screen you're sitting right next to the big red couch. No, I? <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm wearing, <laughs> I'm wearing one too. Um, and just in relation to the Marissa's question, we're not sure, but we will check with our fulfillment partners. And if we can, um, I will endeavour to bring a bottle out to you in person. Or have the question. Question. not volunteering, just oh, I look, we'll do it for free. Just <laughs> there's another question on there as well saying, Is that a picture of you on the Cowmac Ferry? That is Bobby on the Cowmac Ferry picture. Yeah, just, yeah, he, here, then, no. right. he does autographs for free at the distillery if ever you come down. Okay, um, Tyrone's written in a, 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 a rather intriguing question. Um, it's quite technical. How do I adjust my screen to fit Dave Brody's whole head on it, or do you recommend against that? It's not possible. No. It's not a good idea, Tyrone. This 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 is actually deliberate because I want to keep my baldy napper from blinding you with a sunshine. <laughs> Consider it. I'm not quite as considerate. Questions come in. <coughs> excuse me. Questions come in there, Dave. Warehouse Nine was always a warehouse. So again, sorry, Billy. Warehouse Nine was always a warehouse. No, it, it was not. Um, it is one of the original buildings at Bonnehaven, so it was built in 1881. But for many, many years, it was our, our malting floors. Um, because up until the very early 1960s, we used to malt our own barley. So those that have been in the place will be aware. You walk in, low ceilings, um, and there's four levels. There's, there's the ground floor, there's three more floors up above it. And that's where the barley used to be spread out as part of that malting process. We stopped malting, as I say, early 1960s. And the building then kind of fell into disuse. It, it spent a little bit of time as a workshop, spent a little bit of time, um, what else was it used for? A workshop, something else, a cooperage. A cooperage as well, we used to fix casks in there. For a little while, yeah. Um, but then it lay empty and the decision was taken that as we needed more warehousing, it should be converted to a warehouse. So lots of strengthening, Lots of new pieces of wood in, um, and that's that's the way it's been for about ten years now. It's probably been a warehouse, uh, and and we're so grateful that it that it is because it's it's really been a a wonderful place to to hold tastings. So from our point of view, it's great for taking the customers in, and from the distillery's point of view, 
it's it's a great place to to mature casks. Does indeed, does indeed. A couple more questions in there. Um, one says add a couple of drops of water to the the wine cask, and it really develops a much more caramelly note to it. Opens up the sweetness. Um, who else we got? Michael's asking about barley malted elsewhere today or still at home. No, we buy our unpeated barley um, in from a lobster in the mainland and any peated barley to make monia, uh, we get that from Portel and Distillery here in Isla. We don't malt barley on, on site anymore. Uh, we don't no longer have a malt floor. We've converted it into a warehouse. This one. Um, what else we got? What else we got? I'm, I'm scanning, scanning through the, the, the comments here. Um, some of them are saying nice things about David, so we're not going to read them out, obviously. Um, <laughs> hey, um, right, we've all been involved in, in doing Warehouse 9 tastings. Um, and I'm going to ask you a question that I asked Sarah when we were talking during the week about memories about fish. And she said, I've got loads of them, but I can't tell you most of them. So we've all done different warehouses, be it small ones, big ones. Have you got any special ones that stick out in your mind, guys? For me, it's two years ago when I did, literally, I was in there all day doing the Warehouse 9 tastings. Brilliant atmosphere. It's so good being in amongst all the casks. Um, and it poured with rain, so I stayed dry all day, which was good. But the, the guys through, I think, I probably had about I don't know, 100, 140, 150 people in during the day. But it was absolutely fantastic. As far as I'm aware, people loved what they were doing. We missed on all the fun outside. But obviously, we had the, the, the parties and the live band and the disc jockey and the food and the the pizzas and everything else. I missed out on all the wet stuff outside, but the memories were just brilliant. It was just you such a good day. Sorry? Good I got, pizza. I got oh, some later good. in the day, yeah, but which was lovely. But yeah, that was my memory of it, and it was great. Just a great day all round for me. You guys, anything to add? Well, I'll, I'll be absolutely honest. I, I have had more, more fantastic tastings in there then then I could even start to pick out the individuals. But the overriding emotion of it for me is the number of friends that I've made through doing those tastings. Mm. People come in, they keep in touch. There, there'll be lots of people on here that have been at my tastings. Um, and, and that's what I really like. It, it gives people a connection with the distillery. And, and that's really what our kind of role in all of this is our, our job is to give people an attachment to the place because if they feel uh, any kind of a an affection for the distillery then it's us that they're going to be thinking about you know and and hopefully it'll be born a half and whiskey that they'll be looking out for on the shelves so so that's kind of the, the overriding thing with that if i had to pick out one tasting which kind of sticks in my mind it would be for the, the malt clan from Belgium. So Danny and uh, Chris and, and all their crowd, they arrived on a bus uh, three or four years ago. I, I lose track of time, I'm very old. But three or four years ago, they arrived in the bus and there were some big lads. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm not, a, not a shrinking violet, um, but... but there was some really big lads there and we managed to i don't think there's any health and safety people watching this is there we managed to get 42 of them into the warehouse and that was an epic that was an epic tasting so so if any of the malt clan are watching slange guys moving swiftly on, moving on. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, well, look, you're saying about building a connection with the place. Like, that's really what we're, we're up to. Uh, I, again, like skirting, there's a load of stories. Let's not tell those stories. This is a sweet story. Uh, like, it's, it's about feelings. Like, it really makes a difference if you know the story of the place, if you know what you're tasting, it affects what you're picking up on it. So, we had a, a couple coming in. Uh, I've told this a few times in the warehouse, it was uh, experimental drams, a bit like Billy saying that generally you wouldn't like a wine cask, but Warehouse 9 is amazing for converting people. I don't usually like blah, 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 but this is just amazing. This is just doing it for me. Loads of tastings like that. So anyway, we had this this couple coming in, and she was obviously in charge of all the travel plans. He was just kicking back. First dram, legs stretched out, and he's just, he's just loving life. And he's, he's spouting all sorts of uh, 
tasting notes and you know, you know, he's fine, he's enjoying himself. She was very upright and there was a, a travel warning and maybe the uh, the ferries were gonna get canceled. So she was just, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yeah, it was nice, it's fine. You know, second drams, like, look, I can't do this. He went outside, uh, confirmed that the ferries were gonna go. There was cancellations afoot that were gonna ruin all their plans. As I say, he wasn't caring. It was all on her shoulders. When she came back and she was told, yeah, no, the, the sailings are going to go ahead fine, your travel's fine. She, from going bolt upright and just, mm -hmm, yes, it's fine, whiskey. She's stretching back just as much as him, if not more. And the poetry coming off her was just, as you change the mood, <laughs> and she's just like the third dram. She missed the second one, the third dram. Oh, like I can't replicate, but it was just flowers that I'd never heard of, girlhood memories of washing, drying in the spring. But like everything was just like, oh, that's adorable. <laughs> Like shed all the stress and then what she was picking up on. Uh, yeah, that was stood out to me. It was you know, well, you can connect with the place. Whiskey's meant to be enjoyed with friends and just having a chat, isn't it? You don't need the stress. That's what it's help, meant to help get rid of. <laughs> yeah, we use that. Yeah. Right, just conscious of the time here, guys. We're going to move on to the final dram on the tasting, which is a, a 2013 Oloroso Hogshead. Um, cracking cast, this absolutely cracking one. And very reminiscent and very, very integral to the, the core spirit and core profile of Bonahaven. We use a, a lot of Oloroso sherry cast for maturation um, in the core range and beyond. Um, Rodney, I'm going to pass this one over to you to, to talk to us a wee bit about. Okay. I'll show you the bottle first. This is what you're dealing with here, 2013 Oloroso. Uh, so when it was going in here, I think it would have roughly been about seven years old. Uh, so this was part of our, um, uh, don't look to me to be doing too much of the nosing business. I'll hold it near my face, but my nose is rubbish, so that's not going to really. Uh, <laughs> I get more once we start tasting it, then all the, you know, the magic comes in. Rodney, but... Rodney, don't worry, it matches the rest of your face perfectly. Oh, that's gorgeous of you, man. That's lovely. That's, that's sweet of you. <laughs> I can tell that there's some alcohol in the glass. That's no good to me. Anyway, I, this was part of uh, a maturation uh, uh, tasting that we were doing. Where basically, you can imagine you take the the, the new mix spirit, taste a little bit of the raw spirit straight out of the still, and then what's happening in four Oloroso casks? How it's uh, after three years, it's been cleaned a little bit, but after the six years, uh, it would start to be picking up a lot of the the qualities from the cask. Blah blah blah. Gradually, uh, the uh, the dates didn't really add up for illustrating the aging process, so we've started to bottle them out of that. Okay, so the idea is you should have a nice sequence of, of casks um, that are showing this aging, but in this case, this uh, at that time we were calling it a six-year-old. It's such a star, such a young whiskey, and it's picking up uh, a huge amount of qualities off the Oloroso cask uh, in, in such a short time. So you find that a fair bit, as Dave was saying, you get these one-offs, you get these unique casks in, in Warehouse 9 that just come through. Uh, this was one of them, just as far as like a hero cask, it, the, just this one cask, the way it was built, maybe there's some like knobs or knolls or something in the in the the, straight, the way the wood's built, uh, that's just something the angels are getting nothing out of it, holding all of its strength, it's 60.2%, and it's just uh, that somehow creating the magic where uh, all the, the, the qualities are just going straight into the whiskey. Uh, and it's really intense after just six years. I'm getting a taste of it. I'm talking enough here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, um, yeah, it's saltiness, a little bit of saltiness. Like you get all the, I'm not going to, you know, all the qualities you're expecting from a sherry, but there's a little bit of uh, sharp saltiness along the side of my tongue first, and then you get everything else part of the finish that you'd be looking for. What do you think? I'm just on, on, a, on that, a couple of questions come through. Yeah, this was a first fill sherry, so there's a lot of colour, a lot of lot of flavour going in there, and it was filled at 63.5 into the cast. So yeah, it's only lost three percent, three mm. or thereabouts. So it's it's as Rodney said, it's a, a very tight cast, very good cast. The angels had to fight for their share of this one. Yeah, they got nothing. Correct. Yeah. Absolutely, but lots of dried fruit, Christmas cake, the the kind of sultanas, currants, raisins, that kind of thing. Very much Christmas cake, yeah. a very typical Bunnahaven sherry cask on the nose as well as on the palate. Now that typical, like it dries your tongue, but all the underneath yeah. your tongue is just going mad with the... Absolutely. The Absolutely. But just conscious of time here, guys. And for me, yeah, this is 
quintessential Bonahaven in a glass. This is, this is everything that we need to hear about a young Bonahaven. It's, it's got all those things. A wee bit more anecdotal stuff since we, we, we generally uh, talk a lot of nonsense on the Warehouse Nine <laughs> tastings, as many of you will testify. Um, going to get around every one of you individually, start with Colin. Um, oh. What's the favourite cask you've tasted out of Warehouse Nine? No brainer for me. We had a 12 year old Pedro Jimenez. 12 years old and it was still at 60.4% after 12 years. Absolutely stunning. Colour was superb. The nose was amazing. On the palate, you would never believe that was still in the 60s. You would have had that down as a low 50s percent alcohol, ABV. Absolutely stunning. Sadly, it's all gone now, except my little bottle I have at home. <laughs> You're welcome. Rodney? Yeah. I'd be a struggle. Uh, one of them, I'm not sure, it was a Moni PX, but it got, uh, it was a gorgeous, like just, um, we've got a nice gentle one, uh, but this one was overwhelming PX quality coming across and peated. Uh, sorry, we've got one now at the moment that's gentler. This one was way more intense. But I'm not sure whether I'm, I'm phased because it was uh, it was knocked over. Some swine knocked it over at some point and it all bled out onto the floor. So it's like a, you know, it's like a, a fallen hero basically because it was gorgeous. It's either that or it was... Uh, I think the second Manzanilla cask that I tasted in there was just like I've got a very strong leaning towards the peat, but this is just full of flavour. There was no there was no need to add anything extra to that. It was just you know got right to me the saltiness of it. So somewhere in there, Dave. Without referring to your little notebook covered in gaffer tape and cable ties, <laughs> I'm going to ask you the yeah. same question. My favourite warehouse nine cask. Yeah, Next one. We, we don't really have long enough, so I'll, I'll just pick out uh, the the first Pedro Jimenez Noe from Gonzalez Spice, cast 555. Um, the Enigma, the lack of colour, the mystery cask, the sherry bomb that didn't look like a sherry bomb, and um, it drove me mad for six months until I found out why it had no colour. <laughs> so, but it, but it was just beautiful. So so that so that's what I'm picking. How much did you drink in six months to get that, Dave? <laughs> There's a lot of research. <laughs> <is> a... <laughs> well, it, it was a 650 litre, but uh, <laughs> we only sold 14 bottles. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't full when it came out. You know, there was... <laughs> Billy, Billy, what's your favourite? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've got a real sweet spot for Manzanilla Sherry Mature Bonahaven. Um, one of the best ones I ever tasted was a festival bottle called Ruval. And we had two sister casts of, of uh, Manzanilla and the, the warehouse 331 and 332. And for one, it was absolutely beautiful, as I thought. And then we tasted the sister cask and it was like turning the volume up full blast. Mm. And it just blew me away. Cast Manzanilla 332 was just absolutely stonking. And I know that there's a few folk in Canada and the, and, um, the New Whiskey Order group out there that had never heard the word stonking before. So I said to them, that's a stonking dram. And it's taken me about a month to explain the correct usage of the word stonking. Um, but that 332 was an absolutely stonking dram. Just a quick one to interrupt, guys. Sorry. Um, I had a comment on there from Donna from California saying that she's had one of the, she's still got a bottle of the 12px as well. Donna's a friend of mine, so I just want to say hi to Donna. Thanks, guys. You just want to get some of the whiskey calling. Possibly. <laughs> <laughs> um, Donna, any final you, questions from you guys out there? We've, we've got a couple of minutes left, so feel free. The floor's yours. Tell us what you think. If you've been in Warehouse 9, what was your favourite dram? Um, as we watch for any of those sort of things coming through, we'll just reiterate again. Um, the master class tasting is on tonight on Facebook, uh, Bonahaven Facebook page at eight o'clock. Um, all the techie questions can get fired through to Andrew, Brendan, and, and Julianne on, on that one. Um, any questions that you fire through here that we haven't been able to answer today, uh, definitely we'll, we'll try our best to get back to you. I know I see some of the guys have been answering the questions as you go through. Anything else, just drop us an email and we'll try and help you out. See, Brian also liked the 332 and a 13-year-old Monia Bourbon were two of his favourites. They were two cracking drams right enough, Brian. That 332, I'm there with you. Donna's laughing at you, uh, Colin. I think that means you're not getting any of that PX. 
Uh, <laughs> most, people, most people laugh at me anyway. Um, just one quick thing, guys, as well. Come, come see us. When these restrictions are all sorted out, come see us. We'd love to take you for a warehouse nine tasting. I'm sure myself and the other guys, Leah and Sarah as well, that are probably sitting doing very little at the minute. Um, but they would love to take you. We, we just want to get you guys in that warehouse number nine, give you some of these drams straight from the cast. Trust me, it's an experience. It's well really worth sure every penny. That. Well worth every penny. And uh, as you can see, Colin still knows how to win friends and influence people. Sarah and Leah are probably the two that have been answering all the questions in the background. <laughs> so well done, Colin. Oh, <laughs> just to let know, Sarah sat opposite me and she's giving me daggers. Just saying. <laughs> So you, yes, you might have you might have guessed that, that this is not probably the the quintessential um, fish tasting that you might have expected, um, but this is what you get when you come to the warehouse at Bonahab, and it's just a bunch of folk having a laugh, having a few drams, and and sort of talking about for a wee while. Enjoying whiskey. That's it. That's it. Dave, you don't have your guitar there, but normally there's a request coming in for you to sing a song, but we must have screened all those out. Yeah. No guitar. Right. No. John Pierce, we're looking forward to seeing you in 12 days. Looking good. Good, John. Good. Margaret, how do you know when the time is right to bottle from the whiskey, from the whiskey, from the cask into the bottles? Um, that's Julianne's job. Lots of trial and error. She'll keep yeah. nosing it, she'll keep tasting it, and when she says it's good to go, then it gets put into the bottles. And that's pretty much it's the simplified version of what we do. <laughs> I don't want to specify, maybe that would be a little out of order, but it was exactly as you say, the trial and error thing of it. We had a beautiful cask last year that was in the, the you know, everyone was loving it, but then uh, two years ago, sorry, and then last year, the next one in that small set, it's like four or five casks similar, was opened up, and the jump, as you just said, Billy, the turn up in volume was just, oh, like that should have been left another year. If they just left that another year, because that next one in the sequence was just overwhelming with flavour. Yeah. Bobby Borland's just written, unfortunately, my whiskey cabinet is going to have free at the moment. I feel a what? wee visit to the island scene. That's a terrible statement to make, Bobby. Get that rectified as soon as possible, for goodness sake. Why would you, why would you say that? Me. What else? What else? What else we got? He's all very quiet and, and well behaved on the tasting today. This is not normal. We don't expect well, this. Someone has said they'd rather see Sarah. I think they were referring to you instead of you. Yeah, but yeah. I haven't got the. I can see Sarah. I'm not so sure. I'm not even there. It's <laughs> obvious, but you're not supposed to see it. Oh, right. <laughs> the look. Ian's just put up fresh at home Canada. We'll see you later, guys. Um, friends across the water on the northern, northern end of the town. We'll be with you soon. The Bobby Bourne anyway. just put that question up there. That's the same gentleman who drank my dram of 46 year old from no. the last <laughs> no. Endura. <laughs> Dave, let it go. You need to let it go, Dave. Walk away. <laughs> <laughs> that was quite good, though. <laughs> he's, a, he's a very special friend of mine, and I'm delighted that he got to drink it. Hmm. Excellent. Yeah, right, well, that's us ju just under a minute to go, guys, so I think it's time we had a, a, a fond farewell. Rodney? Say cheerio to everybody. All right, goodbye. It's been lovely. Come, come, as Colin's saying, come, come back. We're doing our tastings. It's lovely to see people. Colin? Yeah, exactly, but not on a day when Rodney's here. It's far better without. Um, good to see you guys. Please come see us. Thanks for joining in with the tasting today. It's been good for us guys as well. Um, and yeah, brilliant. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. David? Slange? Uh, I'll hopefully see a lot of you soon, and thanks for coming on board this afternoon. See you later. I'll just echo that sentiment, guys. Thanks very much for spending your time with us this afternoon. Hopefully you've you've enjoyed a bit of the, the banter. Uh, hopefully you've enjoyed the drams, more to the point. It's been great fun for us. Uh, take care of yourselves. We'll see you whenever we can. And Slanger, cheers. Yeah.